Okay, Revelation chapter 12. It's a very interesting chapter. Uh, in a way, uh, one of the best chapters, if you, if you will. Uh, well, the best is, of course, in the end. But uh, this is uh, one of these chapters. Um, if you read it, you can imagine why um, Satan does not want us to read this. Um, and also why we are blessed when we read it aloud. Um, we see God's promise that he made with uh, Abram um, coming to fruition here. And um, that's uh, beautiful to, uh, to read. So we begin with um, verse uh, 1 and 2. And we gave this uh, quite some attention last year. I'll briefly get back to that. Uh, Revelation 12, verse 1, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth, and pained to be delivered. And this is typical uh, biblical prophetic language, which means it's actually two sentences, but there is a, a, an enormous amount of information in it. And when you read this uh, without knowing anything um, uh, specific about uh, prophecies, you will probably at least think of Joseph's dream, um, because he literally dreamt this. And let's just go there. It's in Genesis 37, verse 9. And we will see that in many ways it's not by chance that uh, this points back to Joseph or uh, Joseph foreshadowed what uh, we read in Revelation. Uh, in Genesis 37 verse 9 it says, And he that Joseph dreamed yet another dream, and told it to his brethren, and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more, and behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. So he speaks here about eleven stars, that's his eleven brothers, and he himself being the twelfth. And so we have the twelve stars, and we have also the sun and the moon. So these are the exact same um, uh, attributes that we find in Revelation 12 verse 1. And from this we, we understand that it speaks about the twelve uh, brothers, uh, sons of Jacob, which are the twelve tribes, and thus it speaks about uh, Israel. And this dream was of course fulfilled in Joseph's life, because when he was uh, next to the Pharaoh and uh, his brethren and, and, parent and his father came to visit uh, him, they didn't know it was him, but they bowed down. It literally says uh, they made obeisance to him, so it was literally fulfilled in Joseph's life. But the foreshadow is is much greater than that, um, because Joseph himself he is a a type of the Messiah. Uh, he foreshadows the life of Jesus. Uh, he was rejected by his brethren, and he was actually left for dead in this pit. And then later, during seven years of famine, they came to visit him and they did not recognize him at first. But then they did and, uh, and, and they cried. And so we see the exact same with Jesus. Jesus was rejected by his, bre his brethren, left for dead, actually, literally killed on the cross. Uh, and, and his brethren, the, the Jewish people, said, let his blood be on, on, uh, on us and on our uh, sons. So that literally happened. And now here in Revelation, we are in a period of seven years, the seven years of famine, the seven years of tribulation, where they will at first not recognize the true Messiah. But then, and we will read this in the, well, actually here in this chapter and in the next chapter, they will understand that Jesus, Yeshua, is their Messiah. So exactly the same pattern as Joseph foreshadowed. And this, um, this recognizing the Messiah is, um, is written by di different prof prophets. And one 
we've read also many times, but we we'll read it again. Zechariah 12, um, verse uh, 10. Also a very famous chapter, Zechariah 12, which is quoted a lot uh, lately, because it begins with uh, uh, Jerusalem being a burdensome stone, and um, a cup of trembling, and that is actually referring to the times we live in today. A little bit uh, further down in verse 10, it says, And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son. So here we see after this, uh, this current time and the beginning of tribulation, they will at some point see the one they have pierced. So this is specifically speaking about the remnant of the Israelites, or the Jewish people. And he, here actually in chapter 12, you see why the tribulation period is called Jacob's trouble. It is all about Israel. And we see it, of course, in the woman, the 12 tribes. It's all about Israel here. And so it it's, uh, explains to us a lot about the uh, Old Testament prophecies. Another one that we read also a couple of times is uh, Hosea uh, chapter 6, verse 2. It speaks here uh, about the Lion of Judah, Ariel Yehuda, which we know that's Jesus. Uh, that is in, in chapter 5, verse 14, but then in uh, chapter 6, verse 2, it says, After two days he will revive us. And us is the, is the house of David, is Israel again. He will revive us. In the third day he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. So from this we know um, that it's after two days, after 2,000 years, um, he will revive the, um, the Jewish nation. And in the third day, that's the millennial this period of thousand years that follows the tribulation, they will live in his sight, literally. So that is um, um, what is going to come. And uh, again, it's foreshadowed by Joseph. So the woman in Revelation 12, verse 1, uh, represents Israel. And this is also not strange. In, in Scripture, a woman often refers to a nation, or to a church, or even the church. Uh, so it's a church, or a nation in this case, a nation. And she is, uh, says he is um, a being with child. She is uh, ready to give birth. That is what we read in verse 2. So who is the child? That we can actually read in verse 5. Well, we go forward to verse 5 now. Uh, and she brought forth a man-child, that is a boy, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. So it's clear from several clues here that this speaks about Jesus. Uh, um, the, the second uh, part here, the child was caught up to God and to his throne. Well, we know it's Jesus who sits at the right hand of God on the throne. But um, it also says um, that this uh, this man-child was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. This is a very specific uh, phrase that is being used here. And um, the iron as being something that is very strong and um, that um, means it's, it's a, a very strict rule. And we can read about this... Uh, Yes, <clears throat> Psalm 2, verse 6. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. So it's God speaking about his king. And we know this is, of course, Jesus. Um, verse 7. I will declare the decree the Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. So this king is the Son of God. That is what it's saying here. And he will rule from uh, Mount Zion, from Jerusalem. Um, in verse 9, it says, Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now thou, here it's speaking, the Father speaking to the Son. So he will rule, he will break them even with a rod of iron. You find the same phrase here as in Revelation 12. 
And um, in Revelation 19, we see this coming to pass. So if we forward there, Revelation 19 is, of course, the second coming um, of Jesus. And there we read in verse 15, so uh, what Psalm 2 uh, prophesies, actually, we see it happen here. Uh, Jesus comes, all the armies of the world are gathered um, to, uh, to defeat him. But then it says, And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treaded the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. So here we see again, he will smite the nations and rule them with a rod of iron. So that is the man-child that uh, chapter 12 talks about. And uh, even in uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse 26 and 27, it speaks about the, the church, eh, um, that they will rule with him. And it uses again this phrase, with a rod of iron. So it's the woman who gives birth to the child. That is also double in meaning. Uh, he is born out of Israel, eh, out of the tribe of Judah. So uh, Jesus was an Israelite, he was a Jew. And so that is correct in that sense. But it is also here the woman that uh, is in, in pain to receive this Messiah. Finally, eh, we can say... Uh, so it's it's also received unto the remnant of the nation of Israel. And uh, we will see in the next chapter why this is so painful for them. We have already actually read it also in Zechariah, where it says they will mourn like over uh, one who lost his own son. So uh, it is it is not an easy thing, but uh, it will come to pass as or prophesied. But it says also in verse 5 of uh, Revelation 12 that her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. So um, the child is born, but it's not there in their presence. Uh, again, this is, of course, this has happened. He was in their midst and uh, they did not, uh, not recognize him, not accept him as a Messiah. They uh, actually um, caused him to be uh, crucified. And he was then caught up to heaven after he resurrected. So it has happened, but also in the midst of the tribulation, Jesus is in heaven. We know this um, from well, the chapters that we have read so far. He is in heaven with his bride, and he uh, will not return until uh, chapter 19. So uh, they cannot be in his presence uh, we read just from Hosea, uh, he will revive us after two days, but in the third day we will live in his sight. That is the millennial. They have to wait a little bit, three and a half years. And um, that uh, is, is what this chapter actually is, uh, is all about. And it's interesting, uh, if, if you think of Jacob, uh, Jacob, he went... Uh, to his uncle, uh, Laban, and there he saw Rachel. And he was instantly in love with her, and he wanted her as his wife. And uh, that is also a picture of Jesus the Messiah, who comes to his brethren, to, to God's people, to the Jewish people, and um, he labors for them. We read throughout the Gospels, he went into the synagogues to, to preach to them, but they rejected him. And we see the same with Jacob. He, he ends up with Leah. And Leah is a picture of the Gentile bride, uh, uh, the church. <clears throat> and then um, in, in Genesis 29, uh, verse 27, um, uh, Laban says to uh, Jacob, fulfill her week and you will get Rachel. And he has to work another seven years before he receives Rachel. And that is exactly what we see here. After the the, the church, the bride is being caught up, that's Leah, that's us basically, um, <clears throat> then seven years, one week has to be fulfilled, and then um, Rachel can also be together with, with uh, Jesus, with the Messiah. So it's beautiful how the Old Testament uh, stories foreshadow all, all these uh, events. It says in the very beginning here in chapter 12, and there appeared a great wonder in heaven. So all of this is 
also a sign in heaven. And um, we talked, of course, about this last year because uh, this is sign of um, the, the constellation of Virgo, the Virgin, um, crowned with 12 stars. That was the constellation of Leo, which has nine stars, um, to which were added three wandering stars, three planets that were aligned with it, and this, the moon at her feet and dressed in the sun. This specific Alignment happened last year on the 23rd of September, or more interesting, on the 1st of T3 on Rosh Hashanah, on the biblical calendar. And so many expected something to happen on that day, but um, it says it is a, it is a sign, and as often with signs, when we drive on the road and we see a sign, the sign does not say uh, exit here, it says exit in 500 meters or something, so that you know ahead of time where you have to get off the road. So the sign happens be, appears beforehand, but it means when the sign appears that the event is near. And so, um, well, it's one of the many uh, signs from which we know that we are uh, nearing this, um, this season. We are in the season, actually. <coughs> How it all exactly plays out, we will only know afterwards. Uh, then uh, it continues in verse 3. There appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. His heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. So here comes another creature on the scene, and it's um, a great dragon, red dragon, and, and it says uh, seven heads, ten horns, seven crowns upon his head. We see the exact same description in the next chapter, chapter 13, so that we know it speaks about the same um, the dragon. And um, if there is any doubt who this dragon is, it is explained in verse 9, where it says, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. So it is clear who it is, the old serpent. Of course, it ties directly back to Genesis. Um, and uh, it does so in, in different ways, because in Genesis 3, verse 15, God curses the serpent and uh, says that uh, the seed of the woman <laughs> will uh, crush his head. And because of that, uh, Satan has tried to prevent the birth of the Messiah throughout history. And um, we see it here exactly the same. He is waiting for the child to be born in order to devour it. But of course, we know he's caught up to heaven. He cannot do anything and he cannot prevent the uh, the remnant of the Jews as recognizing that Yeshua is their Messiah. Um, but he will try once again and he will fail once again. That's why he doesn't want us to read these things. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven. So a third part of the stars of heaven are cast down to earth, it says. Now, stars um, of, are often, and certainly in this case, um, angels, or well, can be good or bad angels in this case. It's bad, it's fallen angels. Um, so he will bring down a whole host of uh, angelic creatures to the earth, which is bad news for uh, the inhabitants of the earth, as we will read a bit further down. Now, there's an interesting thing that um, that you might note, that it says it's one-third of the host of angels. And we've seen this before. Throughout all the trumpet judgments, we have seen one-third of the sea, one-third of the green things, one-third, one-third. This one-third comes back all the time, or this ratio between one-third and two-thirds. And we see when, uh, so far, with the judgments, that it, they affected all the time one-third. And so there is always significantly more that is saved than that which is destroyed. Um, 
Here we see again one third of the angels fall, which means that two thirds don't fall. Uh, it, the, 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 the bad is always less and it won't prevail. <coughs> but um, it's a ratio in number, it's a, a, a massive amount. We don't know exactly how many angels there are, but <laughs> probably uh, billions. <laughs> so one third is, is a lot. Many uh, angels, uh, th this is clear from this, uh, they choose the side of Satan. And um, many ascribe this also to the past, has already happened. But um, I, I, don't, I don't really agree with it, because it fits in the narrative here, and it's, it, um, uh, it goes together with the rest of this chapter, which talks about this war in heaven. We will talk about it uh, later. But um, we see, of course, also in the past that angels fall with Satan. Um, uh, even in Genesis 6, it speaks about that, and we have the parallel in, uh, in the book of Enoch, but that's a, a relatively small amount of, uh, of 200, uh, 200 angels that come down uh, the first time. So um, that's not the same as the one-third that it speaks about here. Um, but here, the, the, the cosmic battle that is going on since Genesis, and, and who knows, maybe even before, uh, this comes is nears its climax. And so, uh, just like the people on, on the earth uh, have to choose, there's no more room for gray zone, and you have to be either a sheep or a goat, same happens with the, the angelic host. And, and we see that many, in the last moment, they choose to go with Satan. And that's, of course, a bad choice, as we know. Satan has one objective, and we can read that in uh, Isaiah. He wants to be as God, and he wants to exalt himself above the throne of God. And so he, he tries all the time to prevent the Messiah from being born. He tries also to prevent people from accepting Jesus. And that is why um, both Paul and John speak about the spirit of Antichrist. It's not so much the spirit of anti-God, but it's anti-Christ, because there is salvation. That is the only way to God. That is what he attacks, and um, we, will, we will find this uh, in the world. Um, people um, usually, they don't mind if you talk about God in general, but as soon as you begin to speak about Jesus in particular, you will often find uh, this, uh, this enmity. And that is what Satan is doing. It says also about this, that it is a sign in the heaven. Eh? In verse 3, it's another wonder in heaven. So it's less clear than the sign of the woman, but it can also be found in the constellations. And, um, no, I don't want to go there now, but um, yeah, again, it will, it will become more clear later, I think. Especially since this is specifically for... Jewish people, I think it will be clear to them at that time what what all this means, so that they will know for sure this is what Scripture writes about. Then um, I go to verse 6, so we have the woman giving birth, the, the child is being caught up to heaven, this means the woman is now there and has... Uh, the, accepted Jesus as the Messiah. That the woman is Israel, or the remnant thereof, who has accepted Jesus as the Messiah. And now Satan is there. So verse 6, the woman fled into the wilderness, where she had the place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. And in verse 14, and to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. So there is a specific place prepared for, uh, for the remnant of the, the, the Jewish people in the wilderness where they are being led. And uh, it's beautiful, of course, verse 14, that we see that she gets wings as of an eagle. And we spoke about the eagle uh, last Sunday. So this is, again, what Jesus, what God also did, um, uh, as he declared to Moses, 
he said, I led you out of the land of Egypt uh, as on eagles' wings. This is the way God works. It is secure, it's safe, and he will carry them there. And he has already prepared the place, it says. And, and we will talk about this place uh, next uh, next time. Because scripture tells us a lot about this place as well. Um, but um, And there, she is fed, it says in verse 6. And in verse 14, it says, she is nourished. This reminds you maybe of what happened in the desert when they received manna every day. Yeah. Who knows that this will repeat again. Mm-hmm. Verse 6 says um, they should be there for 1,203 score days. That's 1,260 days. That is exactly three and a half years. So we know that this event, uh, this recognizing of the Messiah and being forced to flee to the wilderness. This happens in uh, the the midst of the seven years, and it's for the remainder, for the second half, that they have to uh, stay in this safe place until Jesus returns. And in verse fourteen, it says then for a time, times and half a time. So a time is a year, times is two year, and half a time is half year. So that also adds up to three and a half years. It's just two different ways saying the same thing. This um, um, shows that without any doubt it is three and a half years. Uh, it cannot be explained otherwise. And Prophet Daniel uses the same terminology. This event was also foretold by Jesus when um, his disciples asked about the uh, end of the age and the time of his uh, return in uh, Matthew 24. And I'll briefly go there, verse 16, yeah, Matthew 24, of course, we studied this uh, a while ago, but it's it's sequ- a sequence uh, there. He describes first events prior to the seven years, and then he goes into the seven years from verse 13 off. And it's uh, verse uh, 14 speaks about the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached. These are the two witnesses, and 144,000. And um, then he speaks in verse 15 about the abomination of desolation, of which the prophet Daniel spoke. We will see this in Revelation chapter 13. But uh, I will also come back to it then. This coincides with what we see here in in chapter um, 12. And it coincides also with what we saw the last time in chapter 11. This is perfectly um, parallel. But then in verse 16 he says, Let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. So he's not speaking about New York or Paris or Berlin, but Judea. It's specifically for for the Israelites, for the remnant of the Jewish people. Here we see we are in the 70th week in Jacob's trouble. And it's, this is about them. And they, indeed, when they see the abomination of desolation, which we will see in Revelation chapter 13, they will flee into the wilderness, as we read here in Revelation chapter 12. It is not all of Israel, or all of the Jews, whatever you may believe that the Jews means, it's not all of them, it's the remnant, it's uh, the rest, it's a relatively small amount. Um, How do we know this? Well, first of all, from Zechariah, to go back there, As we read before from Zechariah 12, this is to be found in Zechariah 13, a little bit further again. And uh, yeah, you see that it goes also in sequence. uh, As I said, the beginning of chapter 12 is where we are now in in the history of of, uh, mankind. Uh, We just read from uh, chapter 12, verse uh, 10. That is the midst of um, the tribulation, and it continues a bit. And then in verse 13, Verse 8, it says, And it shall come to pass that in all the land, said the Lord, two parts thereof shall off and die, but the third shall be left therein. And I will bring the third part through the fire, and I will refine them as silver is refined, and I will try them as gold is tried. They shall call on my name, and I will hear them. And I will say, it is my people, and they shall say, the Lord is my God. 
And this last is, is also what we read in Exodus, where God declares when he, before he leads them out of uh, Egypt, he, he, may, he gives this promise, uh, uh, I will lead you into your land and you will be my people and I will be your God. And this is uh, one of the promises that we find in these, um, these four cups that we once spoke about. But anyway, here it will be fulfilled once and for all. But it says one third only and two thirds will die. So many Israelites slash Jews, whatever you want to call them, but many of God's people that were intended to be God's people will die. There's actually, it's not different than with the Gentiles. Well, we know it's uh, most, most are unfortunately not saved. But once again, we see here one third, two thirds. We see the same ratio. This one third, they will be, they will go through the fire, through the difficulties, through the tribulation. That is what we, of course, read in, in Revelation. Now, there is a, um, a very um, hidden prophecy that Jesus spoke about this that um, I, I stumbled upon some months ago when we were talking about uh, being a disciple that um, Jesus says when he calls uh, some of his disciples he says uh, follow me I will make you fishers of men so they were catching fish, but now he said, you will catch men. And um, when, uh, when I was preparing that message some months ago, um, something hit me. <laughs> um, that was, um, let me read it again, in John uh, 21. In John 21, verse 9 through 11. That was after Jesus uh, has risen from death, and he uh, he appears to his disciples once again. So, in the beginning of his ministry, he says, "I will make you fishers of men." And now it's at the end of his ministry, and he tells them the following: uh, "And the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from land, but as it were." 200 cubits, dragging the net with fishes. And as soon as they were come to the land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid thereon, and bread. And Jesus said unto them, Bring of the fish which you have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of great fishes, 153. And for all there were so many, yet was not the net broken. And uh, maybe you remember I told you then that I would come back to this verse. Because um, as many people, I was also thinking, why, why 153? What is this number? And what is actually going on there? Um, why is, um, does Jesus already have fish on the coal when they are st still in the boat? What does all this mean? And... Um, I, you know, I like numbers, so I was just playing with this 153 for a while. Yeah, then I stumbled onto something. <coughs> um, in connection with this, what we just read from Zechariah, where it says one third will be saved, will be refined, two thirds will die. So one third will be saved. The disciples are fishers of men. The men they catch, so to speak, are the ones they save. And it's the commission that Jesus also gives to us to spread the gospel and also to be catchers, fishers of men. Um, so what do they catch? They catch eventually one third. One third are being caught, so to speak. So the 153 represents one third. Now, how do you get there? You have to think of the number three. The number three is um, it's one third. Um, if you think of three, or maybe you're not you, but I, I think of a cube. Uh, you think of two, you think of a square, uh, which is a width and a length is the same. 
you add the third dimension, it becomes a cube. And so like the New Jerusalem, which is described in, in Revelation, same with height and length. And that's a cube. Or in the tabernacle we saw the Holy of Holies, it's also a cube. Same with height and length. It's actually a foreshadow of the New Jerusalem. So that's cube. Now in, in mathematics, uh, to, to cube a number uh, means to raise it to the third power. So you can square a number uh, it's to the second power. So uh, square of 2 is 4, uh, 2 times 2. The cube of 2 is 8. 2 times 2 times 2 is 8. 2 times 2 is 4 times 2 is 8. So that is to cube or to raise to the third power. And that was um, what I was uh, playing with. Now, you have to bear with me a little bit. And if you don't like numbers, just wait for the conclusion. <laughs> but I want to show something. <coughs> yes, if, we, if you cube a number, let's say um, 18. I'm not going to do 18, but I'm going to break it into its digits. So 18 is a 1 and an 8. Okay? So what I'm going to do is 1 to the 3rd and 8, like this, okay? So that results, so this is good, so, yeah, 8 to the 3rd is 512, 8 times 8 is 64, times 8 is 512, plus the 1 is 513. So here we do the same. We break it again in its digits. 5 to the 3rd, 1 to the 3rd, 3 to the 3rd. What do you know? 153. If you do now the same, 1 to the 3rd, 5 to the 3rd, plus 3 to the 3rd, that's actually the same as we have here in a different order, it will result once again in 153. It, it will not change anymore. Now I just took a number, 18, as example. You can take another number, for example, 19, and you would do the same, and it will end up in 317. Take another number. So these are just arbitrary numbers, but 19 adds up to 370, and then 370 always remains 370. Yes, 3 to the third plus 7 to the third plus 0 to the third is again 370. So it won't change in my this is another number, 911, is 371. Now what is the interesting thing, that if you take any number, any number, uh, except 0, of course, because it's nothing, and except 1, because 1 is always 1, any number other than that will always result either in 153, or in 370, or in 371. That's a very interesting fact. Now, there, there are a few exceptions in the sense that there are some numbers that just, they, they don't, you can't calculate them because they will loop in itself. So some are just not to be resolved. But any number that is to be resolved is either one of these three. Now, let me give you another example. The number seven, which is the number God, divine completeness, is, if you cube it, 7 times 7 times 7 is 48, I don't know, by, by now, I have it here, it's 343, and then you do it again, and it becomes 118, and it continues, in the end it's 370. If you take the number 8, new beginning, points to Jesus, is 371. If you take the number 9, fruit of the Spirit, so in these three numbers, they will result in these three. Now, if you take... Uh, so, 777, seven, seven, for example, now I take the same numbers, but uh, we, and we compound them, as in Scripture, uh, if you do that three times the same number, you emphasize it. Eh? So, 777, seven, seven, 888... Eight, eight. 999. So what you see, if you talk about the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, they have each their, their uh, different uh, character, but if you compound them, they are all the same. 
It's a very interesting uh, thing. Now, why, why do I bring this up? Because, uh, of course, the 153, um, that is the number of fish that we find there. And we know also that we can take any name, uh, any name of a person, and it represents a number. Whether you use uh, Hebrew, uh, numerology, or Greek, uh, any name you have will add up in a number. And if you do this formula on that number, on that, yeah, on that number, which is a name, then it will add up uh, in either 370, 371, or 153. So if you take all the, the people in the world, their names, they are numbers. 153 is simply one third. The other third is 370, and the other third is 371. So <coughs> this is what I believe that this uh, this verse there in uh, John chapter 21 means. It points to what Zechariah wrote that one third will be refined and saved, what we read also in Revelation 12. And um, yeah, to me it shows how, uh, what a wisdom there is concealed in Scripture. So, but the, the, you see the 153 actually says, in other words, one third. And uh, I think it's even... Um, Yes, it's Simon Peter it's who, who um, draws the net. And Peter, Peter and Paul, they, they meet at some point, and then they decide that Peter is the one who um, will focus on the Jews, whereas Paul will focus on the Gentiles. So uh, Peter dragging the net, speaking specifically about the Jewish remnant, the one-third that Zechariah also speaks about. And so then came the other thought, why is there already coal, uh, fish on the coal with Jesus? That's the Gentile church. Because they are, at the moment that the one-third is being dragged in, the church is already caught up with Jesus. So that fish, if you will, is already caught. So that is uh, how I read uh, John 21. And how it, to my opinion, ties in with um, with uh, Revelation 12 and Zechariah 13. Um, one third is a ratio; it's not an amount, so it doesn't mean that there are only a few people. And you see also in in the story in, in John 21 that. The net is so heavy that the boat almost uh, sinks, and that it's actually a miracle that the net hasn't uh, broken. So it's still a large number, but it's it's one third of the total. And what is, uh, of course, um, eerie is that uh, Zechariah says that the other two thirds die. It's not so that they are simply not saved and they survive somehow, but they die. So it's. Um, means uh, some terrible events uh, are going to happen uh, uh, in Israel, uh, in particular in this case. Okay, we'll continue next, uh, next time with the other half of this chapter. Anyway.